from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. In two of the three past years, the Academy Awards given in Hollywood for Best Motion Pictures of the Year have been British films. And they've been about two men, one by the name of Eric Little and the other, Gandhi, who had the force and the courage under pressure to say no, no to themselves to discipline themselves. And tonight I want to take as my text 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, beginning with verse 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. There is no temptation, listen to this, no temptation that you ever face, but such as is common to man. Everybody else faces the same temptation at some point in their lives. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted above that which you're able to bear, but will, with the temptation, make a way to escape. In other words, every temptation that you ever have, there's a way to escape. God provides it if you know Christ. Now there, are many, now, there are many stories in the Bible about young people who said no and changed history. The first one I'd like to mention is one you've probably never heard of. Her name is Vashti. She was queen of Persia, the wife of Xerxes, who reigned all the way from India to Ethiopia. Think of all the oil he had and probably didn't know it one of the richest monarchs that ever lived. And he gave a great feast that lasted for many days. And at the end, in his sort of drunken stupor, he ordered his wife Vashti to come and perform a lewd dance before all of his guests. And she astounded the entire world of leaders that had gathered by refusing. She said, no. I will not come and expose my body to those leering men. He sent a second message. And the threat was she would no longer be queen. She would lose and forfeit her material luxury and all of her fame. But she sent the same message back. No. And she changed history because she was deposed as queen. She's lost in history. But because of her, Esther became queen and the Jewish people were saved. And to this day, the Jewish people celebrate a great holiday because a woman said no and opened the door for the salvation of the Jewish people because there was a man like Hitler that was the prime minister of the country and he has determined to destroy and to kill the Jews. Now the Bible has a great deal to say about sensuality and lasciviousness and lewdness. The word lasciviousness means the tendency to incite lustful desires. Sensuality means the planned appeal to the physical senses for personal gratification. The Bible says abstain from fleshly lust, that is sensuality, which war against the soul. They're at war against your soul and your spirit. And the Bible says abstain from them. Keep clear of them. And then the Bible uses another word, reprobate. Now, these are the totally depraved people. Their consciences are either dead or seared. They can no longer blush. They've lost the ability to discern between good and evil. And in Romans 1.28, it says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things that are not right. In other words, God gave them up and said, Go to it. Have all the 
lewdness and all the sex and sensuality you want. I won't disturb you. Not yet. But be sure your sins are going to find you out and you'll stand at the judgment. And Paul wrote to young Timothy and said, These also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. In other words, they've rejected Christ so long that their conscience is dead and seared and their hearts become hard. And even if the Spirit of God speaks, they cannot hear. That's the reason it's important to come to Christ while you're young and it's important to come to Christ now if the Spirit of God is even whispering to you, give your life to Christ. Because there may come a time when your conscience will be dead and you can no longer hear God speak. Vashti said no. Now, Vashti, you're going to lose your throne. You're going to lose your riches. You may lose your life. She said, the answer is still no. What is your answer tonight to those things that are wrong? To lying, to lust, to greed, to racial prejudice. What is it? Will you discipline your body? Will you stand by the convictions of Christ and what the Bible teaches? Or are you going to give in and go on the broad road that leads to destruction? Or will you go through the narrow gate and go the narrow road that leads to eternal life? Which will it be? You have a choice tonight. God will never force his views upon you. And then another young man was or a young man was named Daniel. And the scripture says that Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Now Daniel was a young man with a purpose. He had been captured in Jerusalem when Nebuchadnezzar's armies had invaded Jerusalem. He had been captured. And he was taken 1,500 miles across the Fertile Crescent to Babylon. 15 miles from home, 1,500 miles from home now. No airplanes, no automobiles, days and weeks of travel. But he was determined to serve God. He couldn't have been more than 12 or 15 years of age. And Nebuchadnezzar, the great king, had taken captives from Jerusalem to Babylon and ordered that these young men in whom there's no blemish but are well-favored and skillful in languages to be taught and reared in his court so he could use them. He wanted to use these young Jews because he knew that they had a special gift. And during the period of training, they brought the finest wines and the finest foods and all the soft living that you could imagine in the court of Nebuchadnezzar. But Daniel said, no, I don't want the king's wine. And I don't want the finest foods. I want to sleep on the floor, not the feather bed. I want to lead a very simple, self-disciplined life. How different from those who can't wait until they can get away from home and live it up. But not Daniel. Daniel was far from home and nobody would know if he did some of these things. Nobody would know if he had a girl and slept with her. Nobody would know if he got drunk on the king's wine. Nobody knew back there in Jerusalem. He could have gained popularity by indulging. But this early no in his youth prepared him for the big no when he was prime minister of Babylon and was thrown in the lion's den because he wouldn't compromise his faith in God. We defile ourselves by overeating drinking too much alcohol, taking drugs, spending too much time watching the television, or going to the films. In Luke, Jesus said in the 21st chapter, and take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life, so that that day come upon you unawares. The apostle Paul said, make no provision of the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Peter said, for in times past we walked in lasciviousness and lust and excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and all sorts of evil things. The Bible says we're to discipline our minds, we're to discipline our bodies. 
We're to discipline our hearts by their faith in Christ. And then there was another young man by the name of Joseph, and he was sold into Egypt by his brothers, and he became a slave to a man called Potiphar. And Potiphar had a very beautiful wife. Now Joseph was strong and handsome. And the, in Genesis, the 39th chapter, if you want to read the story, it tells the story of the temptation of Joseph. Potiphar's wife sort of fell in love with Joseph because Joseph became head of the whole household and managed the affairs of his master and she saw this handsome, young, virile young man walking through the house and in the gardens and in all the business affairs every day and she lusted for him. She said, come and lie with me. And he said, no. He said, I cannot disobey my master who has trusted me with all of this to lie with his wife, and I cannot sin against God, the God of my fathers. Now, he was away from home, way down in Egypt. Who would know? But he said no. And when he said no, on the last time, he ran from her when she grabbed him and left his coat behind and she began to scream and yell and call for the servants and said he tried to rape me, which was not true, but she said that and the master Potiphar had him thrown in prison. And many of you know the story of how he was in prison and how through a whole series of circumstances he too became the prime minister of Egypt and ruled Egypt under Pharaoh. God watched him and promoted him because he had the strength that God gave him to say no when he was tempted. Now, sex is not a sin. Sex was given to us by God to propagate the human race and for enjoyment within the bonds of certain rules that God laid down within matrimony. And the marks of a Christian are self-control and self-discipline. And Paul wrote to Timothy and said, keep thyself pure. How can you stay pure in a world like we live in? How can you stay pure and look at the newsstands? How can you stay pure and look at the films? How can you stay pure with all the temptations thrown at you? You can't. No way. Except one. If Christ is in your heart, he will give you the strength and the power because no temptation will come to you that's so strong but what he will provide a way to escape. Give your life to Christ tonight and let him take control of your life and let him be Lord of your life and let him rule that area of your life, your mind and your body and even your sex. Let him be Lord of your sex life. Then there was another young man by the name of Moses. We think often of Moses as being an old man with a beard, but it was in his youth that he made the decisions that brought him to greatness. Because the scripture says by faith Moses, when he'd come to years, maybe 17 or 18 years of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Choosing. He had to make a choice rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Now notice he was in Egypt, the son of Pharaoh's daughter, heir to the throne of Egypt, possibly to be the next Pharaoh. But he made a choice because he knew that his people, ancient Israel, were the slaves of the Egyptians. And he had to make a choice at the height of his glory, at the height of all that was offered to him. And he said, no to Pharaoh. I will not be your son. I will choose to suffer and die with my people and serve the true and the living God. And that's exactly what he did. And we know Moses today is one of the great men of all history. He said, rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Now, there's a difference between pleasure and joy. 
He that loveth pleasure shall be a poor man, the Bible says. And uh, the Bible says about one man, I gave my heart to know madness, pleasure, and folly, but this caused vexation of the spirit. But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she lives. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. The Bible says there are people that love pleasure more than they love God. Which are you? Do you love God more than you do sinful pleasure? I'm not talking about sports and all of these wonderful things that we have. I'm talking about sinful pleasures. Now, joy is produced by the Holy Spirit. And there are hundreds of scriptures that talk about joy. You can have joy when you may not have pleasure because joy runs deep. The angel said to Mary on that first Christmas night, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. And even in suffering, when you come to Christ, God doesn't take away the suffering and he doesn't take away the problems and the difficulties of your life, not at all. He doesn't promise if you're unemployed that he's going to get you a job tomorrow morning if you accept Christ tonight. He promises that he'll give grace and strength and joy through it all. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, he said, and when they shall separate you from their company and shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. He said, when you come to me and you have trouble and tribulation and people even hate you, he said, jump up and down for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven, for in like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, the Bible says. There's going to be suffering. Jesus said if you're not willing to take up the cross and deny self, you cannot be my follower. Moses cho chose the joy of following God rather than the pleasures of Egypt. Which are you following? What is your choice tonight? And then the last one is Jesus. Jesus was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. Now you mean to tell me that Jesus was tempted to lie? Yes. That Jesus was tempted to lust? Yes. That Jesus was tempted to go with some woman? Yes. That Jesus was tempted to steal? Yes. He was tempted in all points, like as we are, yet without sin. How did he overcome temptation? The Bible tells us in the fourth chapter of Matthew and many other places, but I'll just take that one. The devil came to him when he was hungry and tired and thirsty and said, if thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Notice he tried to put doubts in Jesus' mind as to who he was. You see, Jesus was the Son of God. He was the virgin-born Son of God who was raised from the dead by the power of God and is alive today. But the devil put a doubt in his mind. He was weak, he was tired, he was hungry. He was a man now. He faced the devil not as the Son of God. He faced him as a man. And he always answered by quoting Scripture. That's why we want you to memorize Scripture. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Jesus said there's something more important than food and sex and material things. It's your spiritual life. And then he said, if thou be the Son of God, cast yourself down, for it's written, he shall give his angels charge concerning you, and in their hands they shall bear you up. Jesus answered again, it is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And then the devil took him up on a high mountain and showed him all the future of the world, all the kingdoms that were yet to come. And he said to him, if you'll bow down your knee to me, and acknowledge me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the earth from now on. 
But Jesus said, get these hints, Satan. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and only him shalt thou worship. So the devil left him, and the angels came and helped him. Notice how Jesus met the devil and the temptation. First, he quoted scripture. Second, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And third, he was in the will of God. Are you willing to say no to the temptations of the tempter? Are you? Think about it. And are you willing to say yes to the claims of Christ, that he is the Son of God, and that you want him to come into your heart and forgive your sins, and you want to know it? Oh, I know. Many of you have been baptized and confirmed. Most of you perhaps are members of some church or you're identified with a church and maybe you go to church two or three times a year. I don't know whether you do or not, but I'm sure a lot of you do. But you're not sure. You couldn't stand here tonight and say, I know my sins are forgiven. I know I'm going to heaven. God is willing to forgive all your past tonight because of the cross. God is willing to say, I forgive you because he loves you. And God is interested in you as though you were the only person in the whole world. And you can receive him tonight. You say, what do I have to do? You have to be willing first to repent of your sin. That was the first sermon Jesus ever preached was repentance. And the word repentance means to change, to change your mind, to change your way of living. To let Christ come and help you change. Are you willing to do that? You can't change yourself. But he'll help you to change. It doesn't mean that you become perfect. It means that you turn around and start in a new direction and he's there with you to help you as you live from day to day for Christ. Oh, you'll fail and you'll make mistakes. You won't be perfect. But Christ will be with you if you're willing to repent. You say to God tonight, I have sinned and I'm sorry and I'm willing to change. And then the second thing is by faith you receive him. Notice Cliff said a moment ago, you cannot... Think your way all the way. There are certain things that you can think your way through, but there are many things in the beginning you cannot. You come like a little child and say, Lord, I don't understand it all, but I do receive you into my heart tonight by faith. For by faith are ye saved, through faith, and that not of works, lest any man should boast. For by grace are ye saved. And then the third thing, you're willing to leave here tonight saying, I'm going to follow him and serve him as best I know how. You know, in our meeting in Bristol a few weeks ago, there was a 17-year-old boy and he had a driving lesson that night. And he asked his instructor to drop him off at Ashton Gate, the stadium. And in that great crowd, he located his family who had been given tickets for the evening. And at the invitation, he and his sister both did what I'm going to ask you to do. They came forward and stood in front of the platform to signify that they were giving their lives to Christ. One week later, this young boy, 17-year-old boy, was killed after a tunnel of sand collapsed on him on the beach. You probably read about it in the paper. He said yes to Christ never dreaming that within just a few days he'd be in heaven and we'll see him in heaven. Do you know if that happened to you tonight where you'd go? You can make sure before you leave here. I'm going to ask you to leave your seat right now, hundreds, maybe thousands of you, and come and stand here on this pitch quietly and reverently and say by coming, I want to repent of my sins. I want to receive Christ into my heart. I want to know my sins are forgiven. I want to know I'm going to heaven and I want this new life. Jesus died publicly for you, naked, bleeding, and dying in front of that mob for you. Certainly you can come on this beautiful pitch tonight and declare yourself for Christ. Not only young people, you may be 70 or 80 years old and God has spoken to you tonight. Get up and come. We're going to wait on you. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. 
the love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. Oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forevermore endure. The saints, the angels, Oh, we can only see a little of the ocean as we stand on the sandy shore. But out there beyond the horizon, there's more. There's more. We can only see a little of God's loving, a few rich treasures from his mighty store. But out there beyond the horizon, there's more. There's more. Oh, love of God, how rich, how pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forevermore endure. It is the saints and angels George Bevelache. Then the other person that was with me standing here was my son Franklin. And Franklin will be. He just finished a, a mission in Recife, Brazil, and the last night they had 81,000 people. <clears throat> and then, then he flew to New York. And he was at ground zero this week, praying with those people, the firemen, the police. He set up an office there where people can phone in to counselors and pray. And those switchboards are filled with people that are calling in, wanting spiritual help. And I'm thankful for that little bit of ministry that we can have in New York. Thank you, Franklin. My heart is heavy, just like yours, because of what our nation is going through. The September 11th attack has been called the bloodiest day in the United States since the Civil War. I had two grandfathers. Both of them fought at Gettysburg. One of them had his leg shot off, and the same man lying there to be helped had his eye shot out also. That was my mother's father. My father's father was named Crook Graham, and he got a shrapnel or a bullet lodged next to his spine that he couldn't move the rest of his life. So I know a little bit about, in historically, some of the bloody battles. But what happened on September the 11th was the deadliest, bloodiest we have ever known. It was unbelievable and heartbreaking to see all those lives lost on the four planes and at the Pentagon and Twin Towers. Prior to this attack, most of this culture's attention was on the newest song or the latest movie. A person was often considered a hero if he could sink a basketball. 
or play a chord on a guitar. Now we know that what true heroes are. They're ordinary people. They're ordinary people just like you and me that have done extraordinary things. Who can forget the incredibly courageous action of the firefighters and the police rushing into the burning trade center while everyone else was brushing out? Or that wonderful chaplain, Father Michael Judd, who just ministering to a man who had just been injured was killed himself by a falling brick. We've read about the man on the 27th floor of the North Tower who called his brother in Brooklyn after the plane hit and said, I'm still here in the office and I'm okay. His brother couldn't believe it. He said, get out of there and get out of there quick. He said, I'm with Ed, and he's afraid to go down because the smoke is so strong. Ed was a fellow worker with him and a close friend. He also lived in a wheelchair. Abe's brother pleaded with him to get out, but he didn't. Abe, who was Jewish, stayed to help his friend, who was a Christian. They never made it out but they left a message of heroism and working together no matter what our race or our religion may be. And what a wonderful story. There are so many stories that we could tell. My wife and I cut a lot of them out of the papers that we had, both from England and other places. Heroes laid their lives down for total strangers. This reminds us of what Jesus did for us on the cross. When he picked up that wooden cross and carried it to Mount Calvary, there was no cheering crowds. In matter, as a matter of fact, they jeered him. They had already spit on him and pulled his beard They'd ripped his back open with a cat of nine tails. Even after they nailed him to the cross, they still mocked him. Yet he went through it. Why? Because he loved you and me. And he loves us tonight. I want to speak tonight briefly on the love of God. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the first verse of scripture that my mother ever taught me. I never forgot it. I guess I've preached on it a thousand times. Much of the world is feeling the effects of terrorism and war right now. But there are other things that are bothering us. Disease, poverty, racism, hate, loneliness, AIDS, unemployment, divorce, psychological problems, boredom, murder statistics, moral problems. Our papers are filled with all of that. So the world didn't stop sinning after September 11th. Didn't stop getting bored. Didn't stop the divorces. For some time, suicide has been on the increase. But suicide is no solution because you only kill the body. You don't kill the soul. And the soul is the most important. For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? That verse says, for God so loved for God. I was thinking the other night as I looked up at the stars for God. You can't put God in a test tube. You can't see him on a computer screen. But that doesn't mean that he's not real. He is the creator. He created everything that there is. 
all the stars we see spread out on the entire sky, a part of the immense Milky Way that we live in. But that galaxy of the Milky Way is just one tiny part of a universe containing millions of galaxies. And they found now that there are galaxies beyond what they thought would be the last one. The Los Angeles Times on the 5th of this month had a story about the discovery of a baby galaxy which is over 13 billion light years from Earth. Do you know what a light year is? One light year is more than five trillion miles. That's how vast our universe is, and we're just a little speck floating out in the middle of it. And we develop all this technology to try to make us like God. That wasn't our motive, but that's the way it sort of turned out. Now we're afraid that technology is going to destroy us. Genesis 1.1 tells us, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Psalm 8 talks about thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast created. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. The Bible also teaches that God is a spirit. He doesn't have a body like you or me. God is a spirit. And then the Bible says he's unchanging. I'm the Lord, I change not. In him is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. The Bible says God is a holy God. He's righteous in all his ways and holy in all of his works. Then the Bible says God is a God that is going to judge the world. It is appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment. You are going to be at the judgment. If you don't know Christ, you're going to be at the great white throne judgment. God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Everything you've ever done is going to be wide open at the judgment. All your sins will be there. You say, well, then, I won't be alone. There will be many with me. No, at the judgment and in hell, you'll be alone. You won't have your friends with you and you won't have the parties and you won't have the drinks. You'll be all alone, naked before God. But the Bible also says God is love. In 1 John 4, 8 it says, God is love. And I hold on to that. Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Jeremiah 31, 3. There was a popular song a few years ago that said, I can't live in a world without love. You don't have to. Because God loves you. No matter how bad you've been. No matter how many sins you've committed, God loves you. I could talk all evening just on that. And God is not only a God of judgment, but he's and a God of love. But he's also a God of mercy and forgiveness. He wants to forgive you. He offers his hand of mercy to every one of you that are willing to open your heart and receive him into your heart. In a few minutes, I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of the platform and say, by coming, I need Jesus. I want to receive him as my Lord and Savior. It may never be again in Fresno like this when you have such a moment before God. You see, God gave man a choice in the Garden of Eden. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. 
And Satan was there in the form of a servant. And he tempted Eve with great promises that he had no power to offer. And so Eve succumbed. She gave the fruit to Adam. And Adam was not deceived. He just knew what he was doing and he took it. And God had said, you can have of every fruit in the garden except this one. And God was testing man. And that's where sin began. And that's where all the troubles of the world began, right there. We know that something is wrong with human nature. Terrorism, war, greed, immorality, racial prejudice, poverty. Sin is what's wrong with the world. And only Jesus Christ can solve it. No one else can forgive it but Jesus. Sin is your problem. The Bible says, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. 1 John 3, 4, it says, Sin is the breaking of the law. You know the Ten Commandments? Have you ever broken one of them? If you've broken one of them one time, you've broken them all. Isaiah said, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone his own way. Instead of going God's way, we go our own way. And we get lost. And we are lost. There's a film I saw, I think advertised, called Lost. We are lost. From God, we think we're on the right track. But the scripture says, there's a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end there is death. There are two roads. There's a broad road, well lighted, a lot of fun, and most of us are on that road. But then there's a narrow road. The narrow road leads to heaven and paradise. Jesus is on that narrow road. Amen. And you stand at the crossroads. Which road are you going to take? You have to make a choice. You say, oh, I'm not going to make a choice. You have to. God has arranged for the fact that you cannot ignore that great decision. Because the end of the broad road is death. Natural death, but primarily spiritual death. Separated from God forever. Our souls separated from God. And that's called hell. I'm going to ask you tonight, to, as you stand at that crossroads, to make the right decision. And come to Christ and open your heart to Him. You might have thought you were a Christian, but you're not sure. There's a little voice down inside that says, you're not sure that you need to make this decision and be sure. We're living in a moment in history. I wouldn't want to live for the next five years if I didn't know I knew Christ. And many of us are members of the church. We've been baptized, we've been confirmed or whatever. But deep in our hearts, we have that void that uncertainty. You need to make sure. You may be a Catholic, or Protestant, or Jewish, or whoever you may be. You can make your commitment to Christ tonight. I'm going to ask you to come, hundreds of you. Get up out of your seat and come. And when you get here, I'm going to say a word to you, give you some literature to help you,